Thank you. It's a great honor to be invited to give this inaugural lecture in this important series. And I want to thank you, Kaya, for chairing uh, the lecture and to the organizers to, uh, uh, for inviting me here to give this lecture. It has become the fashion for scholars to characterize the recent revival of citizen strip stripping by Western states as a return to banishment. There's certainly no doubt that new denationalization laws have enabled states, even putatively liberal ones, to effectively disown their own members in order to expel them or to prevent their return home on security grounds. But the idea that banishment itself has returned raises many questions. What is banishment? Is denationalization really a form of banishment? And if banishment has returned, why did this practice go away in the first place? These are the questions I will address in this talk. It is, I believe, important to understand whether the current revival of denationalization is a reversion to an antiquated and supposedly illiberal practice. Certainly, before the 20th century, the expulsion of citizen offenders from the city, province, state, or even the empire as a punishment was widely used across Europe. Banishment reflected a view that continued membership in political society should be contingent upon behavior consistent with the law and dominant social norms. This view was shared even by Enlightenment thinkers like Kant, Beccaria, and Vettel. If we're heading back down the banishment road, it's worthwhile getting a clearer picture of what the road looks like. I have only a short amount of time here, but I want here to sketch a picture of banishment's history in Europe. My talk proceeds in four steps. First, I'm going to explain what banishment is and what forms it has historically taken. Second, I will attempt to explain why banishment proved such an enduring practice across ancient medieval and early modern Europe. Third, I'm going to explain why banishment disappeared in the 19th and 20th century, or at least largely disappeared. I'll conclude by considering the ways in which modern denationalization differs from banishment as a historical practice. Let me just bring up my screen here. Uh, and over here. And now I have managed to lose it. So forget that. Um, I'll just get by without that PowerPoint anyway. So let me begin by saying a bit about what banishment is. We might define banishment as the punishment of expulsion of an individual from the territorial boundaries of the community with the loss of the privileges of membership. In its archetypal historical form, banishment was a symbolic and legal act of communal disownment. That said, the punishment took on different forms in different historical periods. We can highlight, I think, three major historical manifestations. The first was self-exile. In this form, banishment paradoxically involved the entitlement of the individual to flee the boundaries of the community in order to escape punishment. In ancient Athens, banishment as self-exile was commonly used by citizens to escape the death penalty. Convicted murderers awaiting punishment and individuals on trial for capital crimes were actually expected to banish themselves. There was even a conventional time for doing so after the first speech at trial. Famously, fleeing was the expectation that Socrates frustrated by taking his punishment and drinking the hemlock. A similar privilege existed in pre-Empire Rome in what was called the interdictio aque a unius for crimes like arson, poisoning, and treason. Even in the early modern period England, it was possible for clerics to escape prosecution if they took what was called 
and oath of abjuration and agreed to be escorted from the country. We might ask whether this kind of escape from punishment was really banishment. However, consider the fact that anyone returning after having so fled was immediately subject to the death penalty. This was thus no voluntary exile. A second, far more historically common type of banishment, indeed probably what we think of when we think generally of banishment, is one I'll refer to by its Roman name, the relegatio. This involved straightforward expulsion from the political community as a mandated punishment. Banishment in this form could be temporary, period of years or permanent for life, and might involve a loss of property and the temporary or permanent withdrawal of citizenship rights. Banishment was part of codified law in ancient Athens under the Council of the 500 for a range of crimes and also present in early empire Rome where it replaced self-exile. Under the Regalagatio, the individual was expelled, but they could choose where they would go. Apparently, when, um, when Agrippinus was banished in 66 AD, he asked, to exile or death? To exile, was the reply. What about my property? He, um, he then asked. When he learned that it had not been confiscated, he said, well then, let us go to Asia and take our lunch there. Relegatio in, uh, in different forms was also one of the most common punishments during the medieval and the early modern period. It was laid down in the Constitutio Criminalis Carolina, which was drawn up to provide a common standard for punishments across the Holy Roman Empire in 1532. Banishment was usually accompanied by flogging, pillorying, cutting off of fingers and cutting out of tongue. In the medieval period, the punishment was used for a range of crimes, including theft, vagabondage and murder. It was no mean punishment, Banishment's popularity reflected a worldview in which public shaming and dramatic exclusion from the community were considered more punitive than direct physical pain. A final type of banishment is what the Romans called deportatio. This punishment first emerged in 2 BC in uh, Rome when uh, when it replaced the relegatio. Deportatio was expulsion from Rome that involved being sent to a particular place, typically an um, island like Sardinia or to the outposts of empire. Deportatio involved a permanent loss of citizenship and property rights and was used as a sentence for a range of serious offences like murder, sexual crimes and kidnapping. Its seriousness was registered by the fact that it always had to be confirmed by the emperor. Deportatio's closest analogue in the medieval and the early modern period is perhaps convict transportation. Transportation to the colonies was used by a range of European states at various times after 1500, including France, Germany, and uh, Austria, but most of all by England, where it was used for crimes like theft, prostitution, and highway robbery. Russia's use of exile to uh, Siberia also had similarities to the practice, particularly once it became widely used in the 19th century. Penal transportation uprooted the offender from his home, community, friends, and social world. Like the Roman deportatio, 
the transported individual was sent to a particular place as part of the penalty. But it was not an, it, um, it was not an exact replica of deportatio. Britain's transported convicts did not lose their membership status and were thus not really made civically dead. Even convicts sent to Australia remain subjects of the realm with the corresponding rights and duties of that status. So we can see then that banishment actually consisted in um, of a range of different practices. But how can we explain the appeal and the historical endurance of these practices over time? At the most fundamental level, banishment serves three major societal roles. First, it removes the offender from public view and thus decreases the, the likelihood of a spiral of revenge and retaliation that would upset, upset the civil peace from those who have been harmed by unlawful acts. As the scholar Danielle Allen notes, in ancient Athens, banishment facilitated a process of communal forgetting. Second, banishment also incapacitated the offender by placing her outside the boundaries of community, protecting other community members from the miscreant. This was particularly important in societies that generally lacked the capacity and the rationale for incarceration. Finally, banishment promised to purify the community. By purging society of failed members, banishment demonstrated the worth of membership and affirmed the symbolic boundaries of community. But the punishment also had other less obvious advantages. First, it offered authorities flexibility. Authorities could weight the punishment to suit the nature of the crime. On the one hand, permanent expulsion could be used to deal with grievous crimes. In German medieval cities, the same bell that tolled during execution ceremonies tolled while a banished individual was escorted from the city. In 18th century France, an individual facing banishment was treated to the same public display of shame as those condemned to execution. This would begin with a public reading of the sentence outside the prison door. Next, the individual would be loaded onto an open cart so that he was plainly visible and a traveling show would thereupon begin during which the malefactor would travel through Paris, stopping to be stripped and beaten at certain town markers before being formally escorted from the city. On the other hand, a period of temporary banishment left open the possibility of an individual's return and reintegration. In 18th century France, it was even possible for families to petition the king for the return of banished individuals. Second, as a non-corporeal punishment, banishment could be sensitive to the social status of those being punished. In Rome, deportatio was effectively a capital punishment reserved for patricians because it did not damage the body in the way that other punishments like death, forced labor, or imprisonment did. More generally, especially in the ancient world, banishment was a punishment reserved for citizens and not slaves, not foreigners, and not generally women. What banishment took away in terms of rights, entitlements, and community was the preserve only of members. Third, banishment enabled a kind of moderation in publishment. Banishment often served as a via media between corporeal punishment and death 
which was useful in cases of uncertainty about guilt or mitigating circumstances. Authorities in Nuremberg in the 1500s not uncommonly spared youths and pregnant women from uh, execution by converting their sentences to banishment. More generally, banishment was used in cases where circumstances mitigated the severity of the crime, such as unintentional homicide, or where the surprisingly high standards required for conviction could not be met, but an individual was in bad repute. This kind of moderation was typically unavailable to foreigners who committed crimes. A final advantage of banishment applied far more narrowly, but it's worth noting. Banishment could, under certain circumstances, and notably in the form of convict transportation, facilitate various state projects. Whereas death ends the productive use of bodies and imprisonment severely curtails their uh, use, the banishment of individuals could be enlisted to help project European power through the peopling and the exploitation of foreign territory. The point was not lost on European authorities from the 17th to the 19th century, eager to promote the European colonization of the Americas and Australia. Now for all of banishment's appeal and its continuous use during the ancient medieval and the early modern periods, by the late 18th century, a number of changes had taken place that would over the course of the 19th century make the expulsion of citizens practically difficult and normatively unacceptable. The first change can be gleaned in Voltaire's criticism of banishment in his encyclopedia as equivalent to throwing into our neighbor's field the stones that incommode us in our own. This statement captured banishment's essential irrationality, the fact that the practice simply recycled undesirables between neighbors. By the late 18th century, the administration of governance in European societies became more centralized as the modern bureaucratic state began to develop. This new context provided states with both the motivation, the instantiation of the national good over and above that of specific communities, and the power to regulate and to harmonize the criminal justice practices of local regimes. Consequently, by the late 18th century, banishment between cities, what we might call relegatio, began to disappear replaced either by imprisonment or convict transportation overseas to, uh, to colonial possessions. While transportation overseas had become the main option for um, expelling miscreants by the early 1800s, the precariousness of even this practice was evident in a second key event. Benjamin Franklin's 1750 call for Americans to rise up against, uh, against Britain's dumping of transported convicts by sending rattlesnakes back to England. Franklin's rebuke was an early signal that the rise of nationalism and ideas of popular sovereignty were hardening societies into more clearly defined membership units, reinforcing distinctions between outsiders and insiders and territorial borders. From the late 18th century, European states increasingly came to use technology and surveillance, culminating in the development of the passport, as Torpy shows, to embrace their own subjects and to exclude unwanted others. At the same time, popular sovereignty led citizens to make increasing demands on their governments for preferential treatment in areas like employment and welfare. The effect of nationalism and popular sovereignty meant that it was harder for European states 
to treat colonies simply as dumping grounds for their own offenders. Transportation to America would end with independence in 1776. By the 1840s, anti-transportation campaigns had emerged in New South Wales, attracting settlers with the claim that it was incompatible with our existence as a free colony. And German attempts to set up penal colonies in the 1890s in possessions in uh, Africa and New Guinea were also scuppered by the objections of free settlers. Nationalism's reorientation of the relationship between the state and its citizens also affected banishing states. The claim that each state was the state of a particular and unique people made it difficult for states to engage in the kind of absolution of, uh, um, of responsibility that was central to the idea of banishment. This attitude was captured in 1826 by the authorities in the Franco uh, Franconian principality of saxe coburg gotha who rejected transportation because a government cannot allow the subjects whom God has entrusted to it alone to be torn away from the fatherland. As the citizen became more politically and bureaucratically important in the 19th century, the category of the alien or foreigner also assumed greater significance. Thus, while nationalism and popular sovereignty led states and citizens into a tighter embrace, they also multiplied the reasons why states might want to spurn foreigners, particularly those judged dangerous or burdensome. And, the, and this desire to uh, and this desire to discard the foreigner served further to diminish banishment. For the state's right to expel aliens practically required a correlative duty on the part of other states to accept their own nationals back. These duties and obligations began to congeal into international practice during the 19th century. A final important development was displayed in the work of the English social reformer, Jeremy Bentham. In 1830, Bentham launched a scathing critique of the English practice of transporting convicts to Australia. Transportation, he argued, made justice a lottery rather than a matter of constancy and precision because the suffering that it imposed on people depended on luck, whether, for example, one would survive the voyage. Bentham's criticisms captured two important ideas that were beginning to influence punishment across Europe and North America in the 19th century. First, that punishment should be consistent, measured and equitable, the same for each and every individual. This idea befitted a, um, an age of democratic sentiments and nominally equal citizenship. But it was also consistent with the new centralized bureaucratic state committed to formal equal treatment. Bentham was also concerned about transportation's failure to improve the convict. This reflected a growing view that punishment's purpose was to reform. Banishment was part of a worldview that saw the malefactor as a putrid limb on the body of society, one that needed to be amputated to prevent the disease from spreading. In the view of these new liberal reformers, however, the malefactor could be healed and once again made to work in harmony with the rest of society. The prison or the penitentiary was widely believed to be more congruent with this reformative ideal. It was, in Bentham's word, a mill for grinding rogues honest and idle men industrious. From the early 1800s, 
sorry, from the early 1800s, the penitentiary made great strides in terms of replacing alternative punishments, including banishment. In Germany, construction of prisons along the lines of the English jail, Pentonville, in the 19th century, rapidly diminished calls for the expulsion of criminals. Ontario in Canada ended its rarely noted practice of banishing citizens to the US when the Kingston Penitentiary was built in 1835. Despite these changes, banishment did not die a quick death. Britain ended the transportation of convicts to Australia only in 1864. In the early 1900s, some Russian peasant villages still had the power to banish antisocial individuals through a vote of two thirds of the village assembly. And France sent convicts to Devil's Island until the mid 20th century. So what can we learn from the history of banishment? The, the account that I've given here suggests that the punishment of disowning citizens through through expulsion receded not because banishment came to be considered cruel or even antiquated, but because it was increasingly at odds with the sovereign rights of other states and with changes in the way that citizenship was conceptualized. These changes were reinforced during the 20th century with the spread of the international system as the result of the end of colonialism and with the emergence, somewhat after the fact, of international human rights norms, which limited the ability of states to make people stateless and prohibited arbitrary exile. As a result of these developments, the act of, um, the act of communal disowning and the practice of expulsion have become formally separate in contemporary societies. Modern expulsion power exemplified in the practice of deportation is used solely on the non-citizen and thus limited to those that the state does not formally own. It is restricted to those owned by another state by virtue of the individual's possession of that state's nationality. Deportees are thus returned to the country of their membership rather than banished. And this act is justified not as a punishment, but as a consequence of lack of membership. By contrast, denationalization is clearly a form of disownment, but it is in its legal construction distinct from expulsion. Even if a state strips citizenship from one of its own members, the act of expulsion is still another process altogether, subject to the protections and procedures applicable to non-citizens facing deportation. Above all, the state can only expel and thus genuinely cut ties to an individual if she is owned elsewhere. And this distinguishes denationalization from banishment as it was most commonly practiced. Historically, Banishment combined the loss of membership and expulsion into a single act. The expelling society needed only to get the individual out, not to make her someone else's formal responsibility. The modern two-step process reflects the fact that while states, while modern states have the authority to uh, define who will acquire citizenship and with much greater restrictions, who can be deprived of it, they lack the legitimate authority unilaterally to expel their own citizens. Now, this distinction may look otiose from the point of view of the denationalized person who's vulnerable to deportation or perhaps excluded from the state, but it creates substantial practical and legal constraints on the lawful ability of states to get rid of their own citizens. Restricting the exercise of any such power to citizens who effectively have a second nationality. Further constraints emerge from domestic 
and international norms about the security of citizenship. Banishment then, we might say, to the extent that it lives on today in the form of denationalization, does so in a form that is well and truly constrained by the modern state system. Thank you.